here was supposed to be about efficient reproduction production in, in room and health. Before I started, I just thought I would chuck in a wee bit that uh, I was at a meeting yesterday um, down in London and uh, you know, just looking at some of the figures they were putting up and stuff, it's, it's, just, it's amazing the change that we're, we're going to be seeing in the next uh, number of years, um, aye, the short number of years, which are going to impact on beef production. You know, for, for years over here we've been so focused on the, you know, the environmental stuff and you know, we've taken our eye off the ball, if you like, in terms of performance. And that's come from, if you like, government down, you know, that they're not really interested in production anymore. But if you look at it over the next uh, 40 years or 38 years, as we call it predictions, you've got an increase in the world population from 6 billion to 9 billion people. And they reckon that we're going to need to double food production in, in that period. And of course, going along with that, all, all meats, it doesn't, it's not just beef, but the production of all meats has got to rise significantly during that period. So there's going to be a, a, a strong demand for, for meats. And the, the world is in a position where most of the rest of the world is actually able to pay for it more than we are. Because I mean, although our economies may be uh, uh, at, the, at the poorer end at the moment, you know, there's plenty of demand out there and, and still significant cash. So what the, the message was, was, you know, over the next uh, number of years, you are going to, you're going to see more and more demand for beef. But you're going to see more pressure on the feeding side because there's also more demand for all the cereals and for land use and whatever else. So there's not going to be any more land produced, but we're going to need to double up food production from the same amount of land, which means <coughs> we're going to have to become more efficient and we're going to have to get more out of, you know, the, the results we've got. So what's that do for you guys? I mean, number one is that uh, you know we've got to look at uh, feed costs. You've got to think: can, can beef cattle sustain the feed costs we've got just now, and, and possibly what is the future? These things here, you don't need to sort of read them. I know you can't, but they're there more for me than for you. One thing I did want to show you, though, and you, you will be able to see the the rough pattern I'm talking about here. But when we're talking about efficient beef production, then we know in Scotland that we're the best, right? Um, there's really nobody like us. We produce the best beef, we're the best farmers, the best everything, right? It's great, and we are, honestly. But if you look at this here, um, this is just some stuff from Macintosh Donald that comes out of the, uh, their cube op system they've got for the producer club. And what I did here is I produced just a, a wee scatter graph of all the steers. So it's not all the cattle, it's all the steers, right? So it should be reasonably tight. And down the bottom we've got their, their age here at slaughter, and up the side here I've got their weight. So the age goes from 300 days here up to 900 days here, right? So that's the spread of, weight of ages that are going into the factory. And you see the spread of weights here go from about 250 up to, well, towards the, up, the top ones here are 550 kilos dead. So I don't know who was putting them in, but they're certainly a wee bit beyond spec. But what you're looking at there, if you, the message from this thing here is if you look at that as a population, and I would say that the type of cattle from the northeast that are going into the big abattoirs up here are better than the average, even for Scotland. And they're miles, I know they're miles better than the average for the UK, right? But even within that, you've got cattle here which are at 900 days and managing just to achieve 250 kilos dead, right? At the same time, you've got the cattle here which are, you know, we'll just say, well, takes them 500 days, and yet they're up at 400 kilos dead. The genetics is there to achieve that type of performance, right? But you can see that that's not, on average, what we're producing. And as we go forward, and there are pressures, you know, from methane production, all sorts of things, there's going to be more pressure on efficiency. All I'm saying is, really, there is there's some room to, to move here, even in Scotland. You know, there's plenty of room to do something to, to become more efficient. The other thing that we can do also, we can also expand output, and I think. At the moment, you know, obviously the economics of beef are rubbish. Right? You look at subsidies going forward, and you think, well, what's going to happen? You know, post the, uh, the review of subsidies. But at the end of the day, if there's a you know a massive demand in the uh, for a product, we also know we can expand the production and the output from the systems we've got currently. So I would say it's not you know it's not something that uh, won't happen. Right. In terms of efficient beef production, costs and, and whatever else. Obviously feed costs just now is uh, hellish, hellish dear, you can't afford to feed the beast, so you put them on the straw or whatever else because that's much cheaper. Well, it's probably not. <laughs> but this was to show you here, what I did here, just took a kind of 
an example beast, 450 kilos dead, and did some, you know, example rations there. And I've got store beasts here doing, you know, we'll say three quarters of a kilo a day. And I've got rapid finishing here doing a kilo and a half a day. Now, this, that's what you normally get, and that's what happens with beasts, that kind of spread. Looking at the dry matter intakes, the, the intake you'd expect from those animals, if they're stored because you've got plenty of straw filling up the room and you might get, say, 7 kilos dry matter intake, whereas, you know, up to about 9 kilos dry matter intake if you're really pushing them on. With the weight gain that I've shown there, so this one's 0 0.75, 1 1.1 and 1.5, if you look at their feed conversion, right, because this at the end of the day is what it's all about for you guys, it's how do you convert your feed, and every feed, whether it's straw or grain, is deer. How do you convert that into meat? Feed conversion efficiency is 9.3 to 1 here for a store beast, and it falls to 6 to 1 if you're pushing them on like mad, right? So what you're really looking at there is, that there's, you know, you can see that these ones are 50% worse than, than intensive beasts in terms of its utilisation of feed. Now, going forward and going, you know, seriously, if we go forward five years, ten years, whatever, there will be pressure, a lot of pressure in terms of nutrient usage, right, for all nutrients. And there will be pressure on feed usage. And what I'm really getting at here is, if you can cut your feed conversion from 9 to 1 to 6 to 1, that can make one hell of a difference. Now, financially, even at today's price, if you take a store beast with, you know, a lot of straw and not so much barley, your cost per kilo dead weight gain there will be about £3.50 per kilo dead, right? On the other hand, using exactly the same raw material costs, pushing the animal on because you've got this higher output, you're down at £2.50 per kilo is dead, right? So there's a pound a kilo dead weight difference because of performance, right? That's fine, provided you're getting the kilo and a half, right? The problem is, once your performance falls, if you're still feeding intensive ration, but you're not getting the performance, then obviously your costs go rocketing, and then you'll end up being over here again and, and into unprofitable production. So again, you look at Thompson here, and you look at investment in weighing systems and handling systems. Efficient feed, feed usage will involve understanding the performance of the cattle. And if animals aren't performing, right, then they're not going to be worth feeding the high intensive ration that is the most efficient way of doing it, right? So you've got to make sure that if beasts, you know, because beasts will peak and then they'll start to fall as they start putting on fat. And you'll find that as animals start putting on fat, you'll need to just get rid of them, you know, pretty quick. I don't think McTosh will be complaining about overfat cattle for a long time. Uh, anyway, so that's the key. Monitor performance. Other thing here is health and just a, you know, just a focus on health because you know, the feed side of things, to be honest, is pretty simple. I mean, it's not, it's not difficult to understand how to feed a finished beast, you know, in terms of energy, protein, minerals, whatever, right? The difficulty we've got, or the, the major th um, thief of performance that we've got, you know, amongst animals that finish here is, is health. And it's either health before you've bought it or, or after you've got it. But it's things like pneumonia, coccidiosis, BVD, IBR, whatever. But health is a bigger cost than we probably imagine. But we know about those ones there, and really to be honest, from a veterinary point of view, you can either, you know, you can do something about it. One of the ones that's in your hands, to be honest, you can do something about there is rumen health. And that, again, you know, if you look at Northeast diets here, one of the, the biggest risks we've got in the Northeast here is the, is the production of uh, too much acid in the rumen to give you acidosis, right? Now, I'm telling you, one side you've got to push the animals on. That means you've got to feed a lot of cereals. And by doing that, you then run the risk of giving acidosis, right? So, so the, the, the most economic system is a high-risk system. So what you've got to do is accept that you're on a high-risk system if you're feeding highly digestible diets, and then understand how to minimise that risk. Now, there's a couple of ways of doing it. The first way is, you know, a lot of you guys will still use uh, dried grain. Now, I mean, I, I see the cost from, you know, uh, the, the cost of, the, you know, the drying versus prop corn or whatever else, and you look at it and, you, th you know, you can understand sometimes it's, it's the right thing to have dried grain economically, that's it. But genuinely, the difference in the risk of acidosis is massive between dried grain that ends up smushed up into flour 
and lightly bruised popcorn grain or, or moist grain, I'll just say moist grain, you know. Um, and I would say there that, you know, number one thing is, is looking at the, the, the moisture. Number two is scratch factor and get fibre into the rumen. Some of you have got systems there that allow um, you to put in fibre quite easily because you've got mixer wagons that can chop in um, straw. Some of you here use things like, you know, guys like feed mix to come in and incorporate, you know, straw in there. One of the things I would say there is you've got to understand that the key fibre that they require, there's two things. One is they do require some, some longish fibre in there, but the key fibre that, that stimulates rumination is incredibly small, right? It's scratchy fibre that would only be about 1.3 millimetres, I think, is the, uh, is the level they've worked out in uh, America. It needs to be, right? So this nonsense of fibre needing to be this length or this length or it's not going to be scratchy is not true, right? And, and in a lot of ways, the finer the fibre, the easier it is to incorporate and the more that the animals are likely to eat it because there's nothing worse than, you know, straw like that and the animals just push it out the road. It doesn't do any good. So, you've got to look at fibre. Now, key fibre sources, I mean, if you look, Davey mentioned uh, Thompson's rush in a minute, but, you know, things like sugar beet pulp. You know, sugar beet pulp doesn't give you, you know, the long scratchy fibre you maybe think you need because you've, you know, that's what it looks like. But putting in sugar beet pulp, that's enough there to stimulate the rumination, right? And 20, 30, 40% of sugar beet pulp in a ration can make a hell of a difference to, uh, to, to rumen health. Now, as we go forward, um, things like sugar beet pulp are going to be bloody scarce, and it's, it's going to give problems, you know, for this summer in particular, because of the scarcity um, of beet pulp. But there are alternatives. They're maybe not as good, but there are alternatives. Soya hulls, straw pellets, whatever else, which you can use. But basically, when beet pulp gets so dear that you, you think you can afford it, don't just uh, say we're not going to use anything and just go and put in barley on its own. So scratch factor is really important. Myself, I mean, massive belief here in, in live yeast cultures. I mean, there's plenty in the market. We use Yeasac, it's, and we've used it for years and years and years. But these live yeasts go in and they grow in the rumen and they make a hell of a difference to the, uh, the, the, the conditions in the rumen. They, cu they cut down the amount of acid so your pH, instead of falling to you know, 5 or something, will stay up there and help avoid this uh, rumination. They'll stimulate intake and they'll also stimulate digestibility. So you're going to gain, you know, they look at 10-15% improvement in performance and feed conversion efficiency. Other thing is chemical buffers. Again, if you put in lots of cereals, make sure you put in a buffer, bicarb, alkaloid, any of these kind of things, but they make a hell of a difference there to, to maintaining this pH above the level that's going to damage the rumen, like these, these rumens here. And if you, if you want a quick look when you're going out, I mean, this is, these are rumens from, from Woodheads, actually. You see healthy rumens there, and there's plenty of them coming out. Got loads of cattle coming from this area here you see coming through with rumens which are all black and patchy and, uh, and they'll be damaged. Now that there, that, the damage that's caused there, that rumen wall allows the bacteria to get through, increases the acid going into the blood. And those animals are at far greater risk of not just acidosis and a scour and, you know, the problems you get that way, but also laminitis. Um, and that's one of the problems you'll get in these high cereal diets with, you know, with the feet going wrong. Most of that comes because the rumen is not right. Okay. So key to try and get the room in healthy there to avoid um, one night. David, do you want to speak very quickly about Thompson's ration here and maybe bring in a bit of proteins and stuff? Uh, well, what Thompson works here, as you can see, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bulk uh, hopper system if he just cattle. Uh, you know, he's, he's in starting cattle and that system is the biggest challenge. And especially when Willie, you know, points out the, the problem with acidosis. Now, Thompson would work uh, for a start, his diet would be heavily reliant on sugar beet. It would be a 40% you know, sugar beet diet, 10% Invercrombies, which is uh, wheat dark grains, and 10% pot ale. The rest made up with barley, 30% barley, and a bag of minerals with yeast in it as well. Now, the cattle would be onto that for up to about a fortnight, and then they would reduce that sugar beet level down. The sugar beet would be kept in about 10%, and the Invercrombies would be 10%, the pot ale and the same amount of minerals. And that is, uh, that diet is, you know, been working well with Thompson. The, the thing that Willie's pointing out with the, with the acidosis, you know, that, that's a real concern with the, the state, that, you know, well, with the, with the supply of sugar beet going to be. And especially, you know, when, when you're working a 100% concentrate, 
what do you replace that beat pop with? And uh, that is going to be, you know, like I say, a, a big concern. One point I would like to make just to you is that when we are speaking about this subclinical acidosis, one of the main times that we see it is when you're changing from old season uh, barley to new. Even if it's been popcorn barley previously and gone on to, uh, you would have said, even a, a, a lighter type barley, we see a number of people that, you know, that really have uh, major problems once, once they've harvested and been on to that fresher barley. That has really seemed to have kicked in. Uh, one of the main things, that, again, while he's touched on it, uh, I think maybe speak a wee bit more on it, is laminitis. When you're working, you know, a, a, a high concentrate diet like that, laminitis has been a big problem, and that's one thing. When you're speaking about health, that that's one of the uh, uh, one of the factors that uh, really can limit uh, a number of cattle coming to coming to the full weight because once they've laminated, it's a real job to do anything with. Yep. Okay, then. All right, just, just on that very briefly, just, you know, when we were in, in the abattoir there, um, and you go and look, you know, you're looking at the rumens and stuff, that it was amazing to see cattle come through that had, you know, acute laminitis. Um, and there was, there was one in particular that we, we saw, and, you, you know, the, the feet were just knackered, but it was amazing when you looked inside the rumen of that one, then it was uh, it was horrendous, you know, in terms of the uh, the structure in the room. So when you're seeing some of these animals that are going off their feet as a result of laminitis, you know, find that there's a fair chance that you've you know there's so many other parts of that metabolism that are screwed up. One of the things that I didn't mention there was that high cereal diets, you get less B vitamins produced in the rumen when you increase the concentrate levels, and one of the key B vitamins for foot health is biotin, right? Um, so. Getting some fibre in there will increase biotin production, but what you, you're also looking at there is you can protect against some of the, the problems with you know, soft feet by putting more zinc into the, uh, into the finishing diet, and that seems to help quite a lot. So, you know, Thompson will be using you know, high levels of zinc in his, uh, in his mix here, just because it will help the, help the cattle and feet. Other wee thing that David just mentioned there was the two, the two weeks that Thompson's on um, the starter ration. And the, the two weeks is quite significant there because when you're looking at the rumen, the bugs that are in there, it takes them about two weeks to adjust to any change, right? So whatever you're doing, you know, with cattle coming in, then you've got to look at it being at least a kind of two-week period of adjustment. Um, you know, two or three days just doesn't do it. And for the, for the population of bugs to change, um, it, does take, it does take that sort of time. Okay. Thank you very much, Willie. Right, any, any questions? questions? Is it a gradual change from 40% to sugar beet down to 10, or does that just happen? Uh, it's a, gradual, a, a gradual, within two or three days of changing over, I would say. You know, it would be on the forty percent for at least 10, 10 days. Okay. Thank you very much. And then change it by, you know, three or four days, you change on to the 10%. That seems, that seems quite quick. I mean, it is quick, and that's, uh, you know, you would say it's almost scary, um, you know, how quick it is here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's just one of the features of the system. Mm. What's the cost of the <coughs> finished ration of today's prices? Yeah. The uh, you know finished ration today would be uh, without forage, you'd be two hundred um, pounds a ton or thereby. Um, you know, it depends what price you put in for your for your cereals, right. what you've grown it at or what you have to buy it at. You know, but you're certainly two hundred quid. You know, a ton. Is there useful useful fibre in the in the colonies? There is. I mean, the, uh, years and years ago, I had a problem with, a, with a, a dairy herd with acidosis, and it was incredible because just putting in more fibre into a dairy pellet, right, um, got rid of the problem because we took out the wheat, whatever else. But the fibre that's in there, because come back to this figure from the states that they've worked out, which is this 1.3 millimetres. You wonder who's working out whether it's 1.2 or 1.4. Anyway, but it, you know, that's that length of fibre can make a difference. So you're Let's say you're shoving in 20% in the crumbies, which would be a kind of common enough um, level. That, in a lot of ways, is the equivalent of shoving in beet pulp. Right? Because you're A, displacing 20% of cereals, and B, you're putting in a fibre source. It's not necessarily as good a fibre source as beet pulp, but it certainly is going that way. Right? So, any, any source of fibre, and that's the, the key this year. I mean, you know, we, we're big, big believers in beet pulp. But you know, there's, there's other, there are other things here that can displace it. So when you're feeding straw, are you say, a suggestion it would be better to chop the straw rather than to let them just feed it out of a, a bale? Definitely. And uh, there was a, 
not seen him here today, but uh, um, better not mention his name. But there's one uh, one pretty um, large finisher, and you know went there, and I was I was saying, look, you've got acidosis, right? And he says, oh no 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 no, they've got plenty of fibre, and they had a bale of straw there, the bale of round bale silage over there, and they've a hopper which was uh, moist, you know, lightly bruised grey in the middle, but he he just genuinely had acidosis because you could see the the skewer coming out, you know, they were just it was just dripping out the back end of some of the beasts. Now, he actually lost a beast the following day, right? But, you know, what, what he did then, bought a wagon, put it in, 25% increase in intake he got in those animals once he incorporated the fibre, right? And, you know, the performance went from 1.2 to 1.4, 1.5 for the same type of beast, same shed, same system, same everything. It was just incorporating some fibre, right? But, I mean, bear in mind, it was just about all barley. I don't think there was even 10% beet pulp in the thing. There was, you know, a couple, of, a couple of grains here and there, because he was providing plenty of fibre, but the beasts were, aye, not all the beasts were eating it. Mm. Did you see the here? Dying? Or? Popcorn and, and dried. Both, They're yeah. Both, yep. Yeah. Because you would think you would sell a bit of it, so there's both, aye.